Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for having me here. Um, he didn't ask, but I, I'm interested, how many people work directly or indirectly with vulnerability management in, in their day jobs? All right, that, that, that was the hands that I, I wanted to see there, right? So we'll get started here. This is super quick, and, and we'll dig in and have some time for questions at the end. About me, my name is Jay Gamblin. Uh, you can just call me a vulnerability enthusiast. That's kind of my unofficial title. I run two websites that you guys might like to look at. One of them is cve.icu. Um, what it'll do is it'll give you how many CVEs are published daily, weekly, help you kind of break down. So if you have to write any reports and push those reports up to your management, I built this site specifically for people to be able to go and grab uh, data level graphics for, for their reports. I also run a, a website called patchthis.app. Um, what it does is it gives you a list of vulnerabilities on your network that you should be investigating. We'll get to both of those a little bit later in the talk. Um, I'm a member of the EPSS, the Exploit Prediction Scoring System, SIG, so I sit on those board meetings and I sit in their planning meetings and I help kind of guide where the EPSS goes. Um, I'm not special in any way and that is an open SIG, so if you're interested in data science or vulnerability management, uh, you can sign up for that SIG on first.org. We'd love to have more people, uh, especially people who are not in the industry, in that SIG, so if you do vulnerability management in your day job, we would love to have you join the SIG. We just uh, have a new co-chair of the SIG who runs vulnerability management at Peloton, so we're really trying to be more focused on, on the community. Um, I'm also on the CVE SIG members, so I spend a lot of time working with the quality working group for CVE data, and if you know CVE data, you know that that's a hard group to be on. Um, and I'm also on the automated working group, which helps companies and individuals process CVE data at scale because it's so large. Um, feel free to contact me uh, at, at either on X or email me. Or I have a bunch, uh, I have 20 years worth of CVE scripts and data on my GitHub website that's completely free. So let's talk about the vulnerability reality here. Um, the problem is there are 110 CVEs roughly published per day this year. Organizations do not know what to remediate first. When I started doing vulnerability management 20 years ago for the government, there were 18 CVEs a day. It was my job basically to read all 18 CVE descriptions and say, yeah, we have this. No, I've never heard of this, right? One person could do it, and it, and it wasn't a big deal. Um, we, we're way past that now. We're in the age of you need machine learning and some algorithms to help you figure out what to patch. Uh, many organizations <laughs> use the CVSS score uh, to determine what to publish because PCI tells them they have to. Uh, I will tell you right now, that is a misuse of the CVSS scoring system. Their SIG would want me to tell you, do not use CVSS to determine what to patch on your network. That's not what it's built for, that's not how it's designed, and that's not how you're supposed to use it. Um, the solution is, people are moving to patching known exploitable CVEs first. And that's the only way to do it. I'm lucky enough to have been part of a startup that was acquired by Cisco that built the first uh, vulnerability management program that looked at what was exploitable and, and kind of helped companies patch that. <laughs> so here are the number of CVEs published per day this year. Um, and you guys don't have to, to grab pictures of the screen all the time if you don't want to. I know it's handy, but I will tweet a link to this PDF deck right after, after the talk. So if you want the data, you don't, you don't have to screenshot it. Um, yeah, we're over 100 CVEs a day, but at least two times a week, we get 250 new CVEs a day. That's normally on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So if you ever wonder why your vulnerability management people look so stressed on Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's because their workload about doubled that week. So here's the CVEs per year. We've had two pretty big events here that's kind of changed the tra trajectory of CVEs and how they're published. In 2016, um, they opened up the CNA process, which allowed companies to directly publish CVEs to 
the CVE list, right? So if you're Microsoft or you're just even Joe's software shop, you could take control of what CVEs got published for your for your list. That that really took us up. In 2020, something else happened. Does anybody have a guess what happened in 2020? COVID, but also GitHub. GitHub became a CNA in, in that time and started really, really pushing hard on publishing CVEs for all open source vulnerable source code that's on their network, right? On their in their repo. So they shot to the top of the CNA list really, really quick. So now we have much more CVEs, and a lot of them you'll never see on your on your network, right? Therefore, some code somebody wrote one time, and somebody found a CVE in it, and it just sits there, right? So it's just noise. So. Let's talk about what EPS is. EPSS stands for Exploit Prediction Scoring System. I just realized I didn't put this in the slide deck and I'm sorry about that. Um, so EPSS is a data driven on estimating the likelihood that any CVE on the CVE list will be exploited in the next 30 days. So that's a sliding 30 day windows. So every night at midnight, we run the, we run the model. It shoots out a new score for the CVEs and publishes it. So what I really wanna lean into here is if you do wanna use EPSS, it's not a grab at one time and this is my list. You really have to build it into your process so that you grab it every night. At It's normally done by 3.30 Eastern. So whatever time zone that is for you, is, is you should grab it after 4 a.m. Eastern U.S. time, and, and it'll be updated for that day. Um, EPSS is managed under FIRST. Uh, I was lucky enough to work at Kenna Security, like I mentioned earlier. We gave them the patent for EPSS to use, and they now manage that as a nonprofit as part of our acquisition into the Cisco systems. Um, the score is used everywhere if you use Oh, if you use vulnerability management software, over 100 known vulnerability management software tools has the EPSS score built into either algorithm or they display it on their website in some way. Uh, there's a list on the website that you can see if, if you're using it already. So the EPSS data provides two data sets. It's a really simple data set. It has, it's a three column uh, CSV. The first column is the CVE number. The second column is the EPSS score. And then the third column, because people ask for it, is what percentage of the CVEs this is, right? It's just a base percentile number. Uh, I pulled these numbers today. The high scoring CVE is is a Cisco CVE from 2019 for a gigabit interface router. Um, the mean score is only 0.04, and the low score is 0.0004. Um, so that is shared by 7,000 CVEs. That's the floor CVE number, that, that's what you get, that's the score you get if you're a CVE at all. So this is what the EPSS scores look like spread out over a graph, right? We tell people all the time that you have to figure out what your comfort level is and what to do, right? So here's the graph we always show people and say, if you're trying to patch everything, you're gonna lose. If you wanna use EPSS in your patching system, we tell people to start at a minimum of 0.5 and it breaks that down to here. Today, there were 5,671 CVEs that the model predicts will be exploited in the next 30 days. Um, so that's much more manageable for people to, to use, right? So the data's there, and the data is doing what we want the data to do. It's kind of, it's kind of an odd thought to think that we want to weed out 95, 98% of all CVEs, but that is the goal of the EPSS project, is to say that here are the CVEs that we have high expectations expectation to be exploited in the next 30 days in the wild. Um, I will start this slide by saying I am not a data scientist, so if you want to talk to our data scientist, Jay Jacobs runs the data science program and he'll be happy to, to dig into the, the geek stuff with you there in the math. But when they, when they built V3 and released it in 2023, we saw an 82% increase over the V2 model. So that, so that was really good. And we're looking again, and we'll re, 
release a new model in the fall and the V4, and we really think that we're gonna get about another 80% increase in efficiency again. So it's really, the model is really, really starting to shape up and be hard to defeat in what it does, in predicting what CVEs are gonna be exploited in the next 30 days. So the data sources used in, the, in CVE, in EPSS, is pretty interesting. We work with a lot of companies uh, in the threat space and in the technology space, and they give us their data for free, and, and we give them back the EPSS score to the community. That's, that's the working agreement we have with them. But we bring in probably uh, 2,500 variables at the end of the day to calculate these scores. There's a white paper that you can go read to, that talks about how to use EPSS for vulnerability scoring and get into all the math if you need it. So let's just talk about what you guys are here for, using EPSS for vulnerability management. So this is a warning. EPSS is not a one-size-fits-all thing, right? We think that when we do it, we look at what an average network is, and we say, and we, and we build the model against an average corporate network. If your network is different, we would suggest that you do all the testing and all the research and understand. Um, you know, we're not testing it. We're not a hospital network, so we don't have that kind of stuff sitting around. So we're not an IoT network. We're not an OT network. So if you guys have IoT, IoT, OT, or healthcare stuff on there, this might not be the model for you because it doesn't weigh heavily in there. Um, we would love to talk to you guys about that, though, especially if you're interested in building a healthcare-specific or an OT-specific model of EPSS so that we could lean in and say, here's EPSS for OT providers, here's EPSS for healthcare providers. So the best way to use EPSS for VM is to understand that it's for network-based attacks because of where we get the data and how CVEs are, are weighted, this model is heavily for network attacks. So if you have a network that you let students connect to or that you have a big corporate network, this is the model to use because those are the, those are the vulnerabilities and the exploits that we can detect and are probably 99% of the exploits that people see in the wild. There are very few keyboard hackers these days, right? Like I have to be in front of the machine to, to make this exploit work. So, so this model understands that and has been built back to use network-based attacks as its primary course. course. Um, EPSS should only be used primarily after all known exploited vulnerabilities are off your network. Let me say that again. EPSS should only be used as a primary source of information after you removed all exploited known vulnerabilities from your network. How many people have removed all known exploited vulnerabilities from their network? Yeah, so there, there, there are very few people who, who have done that. I love for people to use EPSS in deciding what to patch, but EPSS does not stop and does not pivot away from fixing stuff on your network that you know bad guys are attacking now. Uh, in some point, when we get to a point where everybody has all the known exploited vulnerabilities patched, then EPSS is a superstar, right? Because then you're just patching what you think the bad guys are doing. But 99.9% .9 of us right now have vulnerabilities on our network that you can go to GitHub and find an exploit for and, and run it against it, right? Um, there's a super in-depth app uh, in-depth guide that we just built on EPSS uh, at riskbasedprioritization.github.io that sits you all through this. We worked with Yahoo, uh, Microsoft, and a couple other companies that gave us data on the vulnerabilities on their network to kind of help build out a model to show you what it would look like if you deployed EPSS on there. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time digging into that today because our time is so short, but, but I would suggest that you go there and, and look at that. I've also built patchthis.app, which isn't the primary focus of this call, but if you do not have a threat intelligence program today, I take what 80% of all threat intelligence platforms are built on, put it in a CSV and give it to everybody for free every night. Um, what it does is it goes out and checks what hackers, what quote unquote bad guys are using to exploit networks, puts and 
combines that together, breaks it down, and gives you a list of about 6,000 C, uh, CVEs that we know are being actively used to exploit networks. So if you need a place to start and a place to look, I, I suggest this. I'm happy to take any pool requests or any information you guys have on this site too, as it's, it's one of my side projects that I'm really, really uh, into. So EPSS and the deployment pipelines, this is where it gets interesting, especially for SEC and DevOps people. Um, EPSS is built to be ran this way, and a lot of tools already have it built in. Um, if you use any of the major code repositories, either GitLab or GitHub, it's both built into there, into their scanning already. So when it finds a CVE in your code, it will tell you that, hey, here's the CVE, here's the EPSS score, here's the CVSS score. So I would really suggest that if you dev on one of those, if that's one of the places where you keep your, your dev tools, that you, you enable both EPSS on both GitLab and GitHub. Uh, there's also a GitHub action that I love to have people use, especially if you're using Kubernetes or, or Docker in your environment, because what it does is it uses a open source program, either Trivi or something along those lines to scan your Docker container files and, and your development files for known vulnerabilities. It will then go in and run EPS against it, and you can set a threshold. Like, I don't, like if it's above a 0.6 in EPSS, please do not let this push to, to prod so that your teams can go back and fix that. It, it's super simple. I'm super proud of the team that's built that. It actually made the main GitHub uh, security, advanced security toolkit. So it's built into what GitHub tries to have use internally and tries to have their best customers use. Uh, here's a little screenshot of what, of what that looks like. And, and with that, I am done. Uh, I want to take your questions. I want to understand what you guys want and, and kind of use that. So if you have any questions, um, I'm here for them. If not, I hope you guys enjoyed the AppSec Village this year. This is one of my favorite villages, and I'm super glad to, to end the conference here. There question in the back? So it, no, nothing goes to one. That that that's the model, right? Because we have to we have to see it happen. And since we don't run any IPSs or IDSs ourselves, we can only assume assume that it happens. So those bump up into the high 90s really quick, 97, 98, 99. But there's no such thing as as a 1.0 in EPSS today because we don't have first-hand knowledge and we're always looking at data from other IDS, IPS vendors. And since we can't see at the end if that was actually a, a successful attack, it, it kind of gets fuzzy. Yes, yeah. Yes, yes, we did, and we actually released uh, a study. Uh, if you go to scientia.com, the company that, that builds and maintains the model, they just released the EPSS study that, that puts it against that. So it, it's on LinkedIn or, or Twitter if you can find it. If not, I'm, I'm happy to share it with you. Have you guys thought about putting weaknesses in, in there or creating a light Yes, um, CWEs give me a headache, to be completely honest. They're, they're so, it's so hard to get CVEs to line up with CWEs correctly um, because the CWE pool is so wide. Um, we, we work closely with the CWE program. I've talked to them about that. We'd love to, to get CWE data in there. Um, but it, it's, it's so complicated, it's going to take much more, much more stronger and well-built models to be able to, to build that data out correctly. Because one cross-site scripting is not like another cross-site scripting, so like knowing severity across CWEs is where it gets really, really difficult, especially if you just don't want it to be static. So we have talked with the CVSS SIG quite a bit, and the problem with C the CVSS SIG environmental factors is that they're always turned on. Uh, 
You can only lower a CVSS score by saying that we don't know that this is exploited. We don't. If, if the CVSS model was built the other way, where when you flip the flag, it made the score go up, we would love to do that. But now all you can do on CVSS is flip a flag and make the score go down. So it, it, it's kind of hard to marry that to a probability model. Yes. No, we're, we're just looking for people who would be interested in, in kind of talking about that and joining the SIG and, and to help us kind of understand, A, where can we get the data on who's attacking OT, what those look like, like what the IDS, IPS rules look like, and kind of build a mirror model of, of the regular EPSS score. So if you know anybody who has that data or whatever, that would be great. We'd love to have you. If you just go to first.org slash EPSS, there's a sign up for the SIG there. There was... Oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I mean, it really depends. I like I like 0.5, that, that cuts you down to about 5,000 CVEs, and then you, get to, then you get to marry that list against what's actually on your network. And most people we've seen, when you take that 5,000 and marry it against actual networks, you get down to 50 or 60 CVEs that are 0.5 or above, right? But that's the, that's the hard work and the homework that you have to do is to take the list and then actually match it against the CVEs that are still on your network. And, and then figure out what, what works for your, your VM groups, right? Because in some organizations, 50 tickets to patch CVEs might be nothing, and in other organizations, that might, you know, cripple a, a VM team for a month. Yeah, I, I will put this at, on my Twitter account, at Jay Gamblin, and I will share it with the, and I will share it with the, the village, and I think that they will put them all somewhere too at the end of the thing. Yes. Yeah. So we we did. Um, there's a couple of things about that. CISA has stepped up and started providing fill-in CVSS scores, so we are leaning into those. Um, we are also missing a bunch of data from MVD, so it does hurt the model a little bit. Um, that's why we're having a new model come out at the end of the year that, that relies less on NVD and more on the CNA data. So you'll see a, a big push for us, too, to have the CVE publishers require more data. Uh, in the CVE records. For the longest time, all you needed to publish a CVE was three data points, and that's just not enough for people to make informed decisions in 2024. Yes, sir. Yeah, and, and I think that's where you just have to like really lean into the, the exploitable, known exploitable, right? Like no matter where your known exploitable is, it's, we took care of 95% of everything that had a known exploitable and everything else gets pushed off into our large patching sections, either quarterly or monthly or whenever they happen. But yeah, yeah, I, if I ran a VM team right now, I would never ring the fire bell unless there was known exploit code on, on the internet actively being exploited, right? Like, I wouldn't trust CVSS. I wouldn't even trust an EPSS score, right? Like, like before I make somebody work over a weekend, I would have to see, see code somewhere that, that made me do that. Just POC exploit. We try really hard on our model to be able to determine if we're seeing the exploit versus it just being POC code. We also lean really heavy on, we, we want the model to see if it's a network-based POC code versus a local-based POC code. Because a lot of times we see POC code for network-based vulnerabilities that you actually have to run on the system and, and that never seems to make a lot of sense. Yes, ma'am? Yep. That's a good question. Um, we don't know yet, but bias in CNAs is a whole nother talk because you become a CNA, so you get control over what CVEs you publish for your software or not. So there's always some bias in CNA data at, at its root because that, that's why most companies have become CNAs. 
All right. With that, I think I will will call it my time and say thank you guys very much again for coming to the AppSec Village and to have a good rest of your DEF CON.